10 to 20 cases of okay. pneumonia per day. So this is our cubicle, which is the research cubicle, we have 10 cubicles, and on top of that we have uh, 10 clinical examination room and about 40 patients observation ward. Uh, some of this disclosure, some of the content that, uh, of this slide actually has been contributed by my colleagues and my, my residents as well. So these are the mosquitoes. Luckily, there's no direct flight from Kuala Lumpur to Boston. Because I believe if there is a direct flight, maybe someone will click it into the flight and get infected with Boston. So these are the culprits actually has been going on in the on and off actually over the last uh, year or so, but it didn't happen yet has happened, uh, there's a sudden peak of uh, dengue fever in Malaysia. So if you notice actually over, there's a dormant period for about 10 years also until we saw last year, where actually it's picked up. Uh, it does not really relate to any new strains of dengue virus, but it just evolved actually in relation to urbanization of Kuala Lumpur. So Kuala Lumpur and Klang Valley itself actually caters about 800, uh, sorry, 8 million population, and there's a lot of construction going on. So these are main contributors and culture. To dengue. Oh, Fritz to dengue is, uh, and mosquitoes actually, uh, uh, that, uh, dengue is a fever's development. And it's what actually has happened over the last month or so. So uh, if you notice that the, uh, over a period of about 7 to 10 months, we are de really managing more than uh, close to 100,000 cases. As I said, in my center, it's about 10 to 20 cases per day. And about this, out of these 10 to 20 cases per day, actually, it's 10% of the cases that are involved in the dengue, or called the severe dengue, which is quite worrisome to all of us. Uh, the problem is that uh, the management is very challenging because uh, there's, when there is this presence of poor mobilities, especially in the extreme uh, ages, in the period population, in the elderly population, and on top of that, there's no really specific therapeutic intervention or antiviral vaccine which is available nowadays. And the whole idea of management actually is supportive and actually maintaining adequate hydration. This is where actually the rules of point of culture some come in handy. The, but one would have to understand actually if the clinical cause of dengue fever, actually there's three main uh, what I call phases of dengue, which is the febrile phase, critical phase and recovery phase. In any most of the dengue, uh, what I call in the viral fever situation, actually when it comes to what I call the dependent phase, when the temperature start to go down, patients start to get better. But it's the reverse occur in dengue uh, infection, whereby actually when the temperature start to drop, this is where actually the critical phase took place. And this is actually the, the concern of all of us, because this is where actually the press quantities take over, the fluid loss is the third space, and they're going to be intra, what I call intra volume depletion, and of course, patient group to have volume and so on and so forth. So, and at the same time, actually, when the patient enter the recovery phase, all the fluid in the third space get is what I call resolved back into the intravascular circulation, and henceforth, actually, the fluid maintenance becomes an issue. If you give it too much, then you will develop a fluid overload. If you give it too little, then it does not maintain the intravascular volume. So, it is a very tricky situation they have to face, actually, in managing the dengue patients. So, as, as, as you can see, actually, these three phases of what I call management of dengue actually must be decided must be recognized very early in the management of dengue. So if you did some of the pathologies actually pertaining to dengue, which is lead to the plasma leakages actually and this is a, the guideline that the WHO came came up in 2009 actually to make sure that we recognize dengue early. So that's why there is a criteria now actually based on those patients who have a warning sign. These, these are the patients that have to be admitted. And those patients that are what called in the categories of severe dengue and this such a patient have to be managed in a high dependency situation or in the ICU care because of the issues of uh, maintaining soft fluids in such a patient. So as I said, these are the challenges they have to face when they need dengue patient. The first thing is issues of recognition and diagnosis actually because they are dengue mimickers as well. In Malaysia now actually we also uh, there are other viruses also, and on top of that, we have cases like tectospirosis, which have a similar presentation to dengue. And it can make them one of the dengue mimickers. And the other dengue mimickers that they cause, can cause a false positiveness in terms of 
we call the non-protein, uh, uh, surface protein antigen to dengue actually is malaria. So these are some of the dengue genomics that we recognize quite early. Because if you do not recognize this early, then the management tailored that the, the case will, will be, uh, will not be able to establish or to maintain the hemorrhagic instability of the patient. So the second one actually we have to understand the challenge is that the characterization of the severities. The identification of the severe dengue is from the dengue fever, the critical phase and the recovery phase and they have to really do what I call identify the leakage syndrome that took place. This is where the game and it also offers some kind of handies. And the phases of disease are the prebratical and the last but not least the issues of quick management which is resuscitation and stabilization and the main that's the problem we have seen there because in terms of managing fluids actually in dengue, these are the ideal situation where it's a drop more or a drop less, we, we can't afford this such a species, but it's just nice for that particular patient. So how can focus uh, helps? So I just want to show you very quickly two cases that uh, uh, more or less day to day actually we're managing. This is a, a young fella which it had came in with day five fever with the typical warning sign of dengue, which is very general to any other form of viral fever. So what actually you can uh, establish here from this clinical assessment, actually this patient, actually this boy actually showed evidence of warning sign. Meaning when they have a warning sign, there is already a criteria, clear criteria for such patient to be admitted. But what's the next question being posed is what's next? How much fluids to give? Does the fluid be adequate for this particular patient? If you say, if we give too much during the critical phase, then during the resulting phase, patient can develop fluid overload. So the usual stuff that we do, I think I do need to uh, uh, to uh, educate all of you, all of you are well versed about ultrasound. These are the common point of care ultrasound that we need to such patient in dengue. But one thing that actually pretty uh, uh, clear here is not just about the free assessment per se, but we noticed for the purpose of recognition, one of the main findings that we were able to establish, and some of the papers has come up on, on this matter, actually, is the thickening of bone by the wall, which is one of the earliest signs that actually uh, differentiate between a febrile phase and what we call a critical phase of dengue. And henceforth also to, to uh, categorize the patient in the severe dengue categorization. At the same time, on top of that, we have a point of care test, which is the common full blood count. We look at the total white, we look at the hematocrit, we look at the platelet count, which is when elevation of the hematocrit and the lowering down of the platelets. This is used to a traditional, actually, point of care test that we use in order to detect either to identify the patient in the paralyzed space or critical phase. But now, with the, with the usage of point of care ultrasound, we can go one step further, such as to look where are the fluid loss that occur in the patient and there is an evidence of the syndrome. And at the same time, we have to do a point of care test, which is the NS1, which is the non-structural protein, one for dengue, which is detected, which is as good as about 97 to 98% in terms of sensitivity to pick up a dengue case within the first three days of dengue infection. So what happened actually for this particular case, there are many dengue fever, in shock, at day five of illness, in critical phase, in compensation, in compensation shock, based on the point of point of what called focus history, point of care test, and the top of that is uh, what I call a point of care ultrasound finding. So this is actually how the patient developed by WHO. The first time is kilo, 10 to 20 kilo, kilo based on the patient tumor dynamic stability. But at the same time, look at the input and output so on and so forth. This is also another opportunity for us actually, to use the point of care ultrasound to help us actually to what I call direct the management of fluid in such a patient. So this is again actually where we need the usage of ultrasound. And again, once the fluid has been given to so do a point of care ultrasound again, to look the common findings that we look at, we look at the IBC assessment, we look at how good is my lipidic contractility is, where we look at the acidic fluid loss in the third space also. Because one thing is why it is important for us to do a bedside cardiac ultrasound, because in such cases of dengue, it's well documented that there is going to be a transient deterioration of the myocardial function. So this is something that we need to recognize because, because before this we are doing a guessing game because for us to do a good detailed echocardiography is not many people are going to be too well trained for that. So we have to use what I call a qualitative assessment to look at how the myocardial function or for us to judge within that phase of critical phase how good is the myocardial function. So by doing, doing a bedside ultrasound, we are able to actually recognize such patients early and henceforth actually manage the patient in terms of management a bit more judicious. 
and then we look again, actually based on that, I mean, this is how the patient progressed. If you look from the narrowing and pulse pressure, the pulse pressure could stabilize, and this patient was discharged well about a week later. And these are the various spaces that can be actually able to use the point of the ultrasound to help out the management of our limitation. So, and then the simulation actually, the, uh, we came out actually with our new CPG, I think the latest guideline among the Southeast Asia country, which is uh, uh, about a month ago. And this is the algorithm that we have used for the cases of hypersectic shock. So where actually the point of the ultrasound have been uh, incorporated into, you know, in the, uh, the various actually uh, areas actually you need the algorithm where actually we can incorporate the ultrasound or bedside ultrasound. Okay. So this, as I said, this patient was well and discharged after day seven. And we look at the second cases, which is a bit more tricky. Where we thought we involved, it's not just a one single dengue fever uh, or in terms of mobility. So there's a comorbid. This lady also had uh, also a diabetes mellitus on top of that. So, meaning that so we are not just managing uh, dengue fever, but also managing diabetes due to acidosis. Which is, we know actually there's a trouble of vascular volume depletion. And hence, for it will be very tricky. If you give it too much, you're going to be fluid over. If it's too little, then it's going to affect the others' uh, comorbidities as well. So, again, actually, these are the warning signs that occur. I think when we say with evidence of uh, tachypnea, there's evidence of tachycardia, and the patient is very lethargic looking. And we do the usual point of care testing, you look at the total Y, the NS1, and so on and so forth, and there's evidence of severe metabolic acidosis as well, which is meaning that in such a patient, actually we know there's a volume this patient, and on top of that patient have a dengue infection. So this is a very tricky situation, whereby we know actually in such a patient, the mobility is higher compared to the other patients. <coughs> We do the, the usual uh, point of care ultrasound finding, which is all of us do in day to day practice, to actually to assess how good the patient actually before we start giving fluid. Then, after that, and this is the focus of what I call the assessment of the patient. We show there is evidence of uh, left ventricular hyperkinetic and underfill. There's no evidence of pericardial effusion. There's no pro effusion and so on and so forth. Actually, the IBC assessment and the, the A profile all for the low. All lungs. So meaning that, and then one thing that we notice also here, actually, there's evidence of all better wall thickening, which is with some polypolyl, what we call polycystic free collation, and uh, that's uh, been seen in such a patient. So this also another actually what we call criteria that we can incorporate into in managing a patient, dengue patient in the critical phase. And what we call, so what we come with this, so in the case of dengue fever with warning sign with day four alertness. Four hours into that person phase, and on top of that patient have diabetic ketoacidosis, and of course the patient having newly diagnosed that type of diabetes mellitus. So I'm sure that we will have such a patient in front of us, it will be very difficult because it's a fluid management to be, going to be essential to, to determine the outcome of such a patient. So these are the challenges we're going to face because the markers of severe dengue is slickish. And on top of that patient has a underlying diabetes mellitus. Patient, uh, what I call the pressure is coming down, there's evidence of hemoconcentration, concentration. And in terms of the fluid management, as I said earlier, uh, not a single drop less or more. So, meaning that we have a combination of DP and CV dengue. If you get too little, the patient will progress into refractory shock. If you give it too much, the patient will go into respiratory distress. So, these are the dilemma that we do have actually with managing such a patient. This is a very difficult, I say, when we have such a patient in front of us. There's no way I'm going to uh, what I call, walk away from my ship when, when the new fella comes in. I will have to be there to make sure that a proper handoff will be carried out and therefore that this patient will be managed accordingly. So you look how this patient progress. I said this is the three management and super trend. So how much we give it at the same time for this particular patient to ensure evidence of immunodynamic stability. So again, actually for such a patient, actually we use a common what I call a uh, bedside ultrasound for us to assist for such a patient. Uh, I think the one, the last one doesn't come up. Yeah, yes, it does. So you see that the evidence of ball by the wall taken with some early is is quite, is quite, uh, is quite what I call pronounced actually the, the evidence of ball by the wall taken and early polycystic uh, what I call collection. And we look at the hemodynamic instability. This is what would happen from the narrow part pressure. The part pressure starts to stabilize, uh, and uh, the heart rate starts to come down. And to, 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 meaning that, that this patient we are going to the right direction. 
So this is how the patient progresses only. So as I said, uh, this is uh, some various, occur various things that occur in during dengue. We're concerned about occult bleeding. Occult bleeding unfortunately occur in this particular patient. So how does we detect? Of course, the ultrasound actually on, give us the clue of, of evidence of occult bleeding. And on top of that, there's a rising hematocrit. At the same time, also the reduction of the platelet count. So uh, in this uh, the patient into what I call into ventilator to be distressed. They require a supportive non-invasive ventilation. And, uh, and after that patient went into agitation, which is another not good sign. And subsequently have to be intubated, ventilated, and subsequently have to go uh, for such uh, bus suppressors. Every stage of where this happens actually, this is where actually the point of care for some come in handy because it, that it, it relates, actually it becomes a, a second tool and extent of our clinical examination to ensure that at what stage that we are managing this particular patient. So this is actually the issue of the chart and fortunately this patient is doing quite well uh, a few days later and then by the day 6 actually we were able to stop the bus suppressor and day 9 is the patient is discharged. Well, actually, so this is some of the examples of the cases. Meaning that we look at the algorithm that is proposed by the patient that line, we we'll talk about the patient actually where actually they are in uh, the required to resuscitation, where actually then we utilize the what I call the ultrasound. So, meaning that at every stage of the management, actually, we're going to use the point of care ultrasound actually in order to ascertain actually what actually really going on to the, this particular patient. So. So meaning that, what are the evidence in terms of pocket ultrasound in dengue? It is not much. It's one of the earlier studies that came out way back in 1995, actually when they look at the gold barrier wall thickening. But it's only in isolation. It does not really correlate with other parameters. So because we need a few criteria, a few parameters to come in together, it's not just a ultrasound per se, as been mentioned by the previous speaker. We need a focus, what I call a focus history, focus clinical access to our bedside, Test and also focus of ultrasound. Combine all these together, integrated, and then you come up with actually the, to increase what I call the sensitivity or the specificity of diagnosing at what stage of uh, dengue, uh, what I call dengue fever we are managing. This is actually what we're looking to. And this is, as I said, some of the earlier studies that I mentioned actually the, the role of ultrasound. She's looking just at the ring that either in the favorite phase or this particular phase, which is but, uh, how that the gold barrier wall technique is one of the criteria actually. Uh, it will come in handy actually for us to make a diagnosis of uh, dengue fever. This, some of these uh, this studies, uh, this is one of the uh, bigger studies that uh, what I call uh, in, in the adult patient in, in Indonesia. It so also came up with uh, more or less the same uh, finding, which is the gold weather wall thickening and then the evidence of uh, uh, what I call collection around the gold weather wall is one of the indicators of uh, severe dengue. So again, this is another one actually in the pediatric population, but if you look at the pediatric population, the uptake or the, the criteria for global technique is not as much or in terms of high, less percent, less uh, what percentage compared to the adult population. In fact, actually papers that came out on this actually is not much in the adult population, just mainly purely on the pediatric population. So I just... Uh, uh, I'm actually one of the principal investigators uh, for using best ultrasound in dengue in Malaysia. So hopefully, I think by next year, we're able to come up this, with this paper because based on the recent uh, uh, crisis that we have in dengue, it's actually we are putting uh, close to about a thousand patients then to see actually what sorts of uh, uh, focus can do in order for us to detect ultrasound. And then my colleague, Dr. Dr. Adi Osman, has to try to correlate with IBC assessment for in management of dengue in, in dengue fevers uh, as well. So this is some of the things that come up because as I said, these are the new areas that we are able to look into and take the opportunity that the recent dengue is uh, what I call uh, increment uh, cases in, in, in Malaysia. So again, this is uh, the one of the few that come up actually looking again at the sonographic uh, finding in diagnosis assessment of dengue fevers. Again, if you look at the gold medal world thickening and uh, what corporate equation and site is actually one of the criteria actually to look into. And as I said, this is our, the spectrum of gold medal wall thickening as thick as more than 3 to 5 millimeters, 5 meter more, and some of the it's flexion. As a what I call as a, what I call a spectrum of gold medal wall thickening that relates to the severity of dengue. Uh, and if you look at the, the, the evidence of uh, dengue and cardiac function, so based on the studies that come up from the Vietnamese group, actually, uh, there's, there's a conflicting what we call uh, outcome. 
there are few because the numbers of cases is not a lot. Uh, there's a COVID thing, there's a cases whereby there's some are regarding <coughs> but some of the studies came out that's not really related much in terms of uh, what we call biological function. This is also another area that we can do that in managing the dengue. So meaning that uh, what if you see this is 2015 guideline. So this is the first time that the nation uh, uh, incorporate such uh, point of care ultrasound as one of the adjunct that we utilize for the purpose of dengue. And, uh, and hopefully, actually, uh, when evidence, uh, more evidence come up, actually, uh, the roles of focus record in, in many dengue uh, patients going to be, become more evidence for us to ensure that the management uh, actually of dengue patients tailored to individual cases. So, meaning that what are the take home messages that we look at here? So, we talk about dengue and focus. First, actually, we talk about diagnostic recognition. The gold weather wall thickening in a febrile patient should be suggested of procedure of dengue fever. Meaning that the focus approach we look at, we look at the focus history, we look at the warning sign of the patient, we look at the gold weather wall thickening, we look at evidence of free fluid in the plural, peritone, and pericardium. And as there is evidence of, uh, if all this is positive, it's, the likelihood of patient having dengue fever is very high. Okay? And the second one, actually, we look at the what we call dengue uh, the, uh, disease severity. We combine the point of care testing, the full blood count results, the NS1 finding, and the dengue, dengue IgM positivity. Combine that with the what we call positivity of called by the wall thickening and free free thickening, meaning that we can very, very, actually, we can clearly state this patient having a leakage syndrome or severe dengue. Meaning that is where, actually, we can be very careful in terms of fluid management in the dengue uh, cases. And we we'll look at the, the third one, we we'll look at the phases of disease, the fluid amount, the correlation with the clinical assessment to ascertain either the patient in the febrile, either the patient in the critical phase, or the patient in the retrograde phase of dengue. And last but not least, actually, we we'll look into the scenario <coughs> of uh, uh, what we call uh, the, the dengue management uh, syndrome and management, uh, the dengue syndrome management and monitoring, where actually the roles of Fluid resuscitation and require using a non-invasive method because uh, in dengue or we call it the occur, we want to run, we want to try to avoid for any invasive procedures and the use of non-invasive method uh, so we call qualitative or semi-quantitative to guide the fluid therapy in a limited resource area. Which is in Malaysia also, despite the modernization in some of the various cities, but those that that uh, what we call suburbs or those in the district areas actually. The availabilities of uh, what we call new technology still scarce, and then we have to look into that because this is where actually the point of the ultrasound can be handy. Okay, with that, thank you very much. Uh, I hope that uh, this. Uh, <laughs>